Hello, everyone. Todd Sheldon here with CFI Pro Courses. And today, another very happy member of uh, our Aviation Society. I'm here with John De La Cruz, and John's calling in tonight from Delaware. And uh, John just recently did something amazing. He passed his CFI initial check ride. And I know that all of you on here are so incredibly proud of John. I know he's proud of himself for doing this. And, you know, as we all know, it's a lot of prep that goes through and a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety goes through with that. So I'm going to turn it over to John and I'm going to let him introduce himself and then tell us a little bit about his preparation and how his check ride went and maybe some advice for some of you coming along uh, up the ranks as you're preparing and hopefully uh, all the pain and anguish that John went through to get where he is today, maybe that can help you uh, to better yourself one day as well. John, welcome to the call. Tell us a little bit about yourself and then tell us how you prepared. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for having me. Pleasure, pleasure. Um, so yeah, like, like Todd said, like Todd said, um, John De La Cruz, I'm in Delaware, uh, originally from Florida, but uh, you know, the Air Force brings me here. And like he said, I um I just passed my CFI check ride on the 5th of August. So very recently. And uh, I started, um, I'll, I'll kind of start from where I started. I started in February of this year and it, I just finished in August. It, it took, I had, I had a lot of push. I have a friend that um, really pushes me and kind of me and him kind of neck and neck. Uh, he finished fairly quickly. And I, I kind of took it upon myself to say, I need to, I need to go ahead. So he kind of took off on me and I, I kind of didn't want to let it, but life got in the way. I got a new job and a bunch of other things. And uh, so I, my process was a little slower. You know, I've seen people do the CFI stuff in weeks and, and days. It took me six months, but I will say I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had it any different way because I was so prepared when I got to the check ride. So kind of to start off, I did uh, like I said, I started in February. I think the hardest part for me was uh, getting getting familiar with flying on the right seat. Uh, things that I thought were simple were not. So flying from the right seat took about 10 hours for me. It took about 10 hours. And I'm someone that just kind of, I like to take it step by step. I don't want to rush. There was no rush in my life. I didn't need it for a degree. I had already graduated, got my bachelor's. So um, I took it slow, took it steady. And um, something as simple as steep turns was hard. Um, but eventually after, you know, practice, I got it. And then as the months went by, I think once I got the writtens out the way, the FOIs, and once I got the FIA out of the way, that is when I said, okay, I need to start turning it up and on. So I finished, the, I finished that in May and June. I finished in June and I figured, okay, I need to start doing things. I think the FOIs was the hardest. It wasn't really the hardest, but the most challenging thing because it's, People say it's not aviation related. I totally disagree. I think it's all it all has to do with being aviation related because it's we're, we're we're talking about the psychology of why someone thinks the way they do. Students, which we are all students, right? So I I, I really like the FOIs and I read through the whole book. Um, I went through it with my instructor. We went through the whole book so I can get my uh, you know I can log all that ground. And then it still was foreign to me. I needed somebody to kind of teach it to me. So I would be on YouTube and that's when I uh, came across Todd and I saw that he had a whole course um, on the FOIs and I spent every night um, filling up this notebook right here. This notebook entirely filled up with notes on FOIs, the whole thing, uh, FOIs and then the FARs as well. So I went through, I would pick a night out of the week. And I would just watch one of the videos because it's lengthy videos, but it's very, very informative. And just the way that Todd taught it made sense. So every night I'll sit out um, because I have a son. So by the time my son went to bed, I would just sit on the couch, pull out my notebook and just start watching. And I'll write notes because I'm somebody that likes to learn while I write and then I'll have something to reference it. So I would do that every night, uh, watch the videos, finish the whole series of the FOIs. And then um, after that, I went into the FARs because I knew the FARs. These are all things that we know, but do we know how to teach it? And that was the, that was the biggest thing. Um, so I went through all that. The FOIs made sense. I made uh, cheat sheets or like a little thing where I just wrote everything down, all the acronyms. I put the pyramid in there, uh, things that would just help me memorize. And I had this on the cover of my, my binder. So every time that I practice, I would look at it. And I'll be able to see all the acronyms that Todd came up with, like the HEMPs uh, for the, prof the instructor professionalism and responsibilities. Um, I just kind of went, went over that, that way. I had the PTS. So everything that Todd talks about on his videos, I just 
I would do that. And then I'll write it down. And then I would just do that progressively and progressively as the days got closer to my check ride. Um, and then I would also teach. Uh, I had, in our, in our flight school, we have a lot of students and I have a lot of friends that are, are doing the private pilot. So my instructor would just say, hey, with my supervision, you know, feel free to teach them. So I would, uh, I would sit there with my lesson plans and I would teach. And if there was something that I kind of got stumped on or I didn't know how to say, my instructor would just jump in, I'd put it on my notes, and then I'll just continue. And I taught a lot, believe it or not. There was a lot of things uh, that I taught, but I focused on my weak areas like aerodynamics. I knew what it was, but how, did, how do I teach it? I didn't know how to explain to someone why, you know, Bernoulli's principle is the way it is, why the aircraft, what happens when things go into ground effects. So like things like that, I didn't know how to teach it. And so I think preparing myself to teach and teaching other people, exposing myself to students really helped out because uh, when I went to my, my check ride, came, come, come the day of the check ride, uh, I made sure that I tabbed the heck out of my FAR. It was tabbed out with everything that Todd went over from the FARs, from recreational pilots, everything, everything that I covered, um, I highlighted everything. I landed everything, wrote some notes. So when it came time to my check ride, my D and I opened my DP asked me all those scenario questions. I opened my my book and I was like, well, sir, here it is. And then here it is. And he was just impressed. At one point, he was like, I don't even know what else to ask you. Because he asked me the there was one question that I'll quickly share. He said, What what, what do you need to do if um I have a rotorcraft, the typical CFI question. I want to go commercial rotorcraft to airplane, um, to airplane commercial. And I was like, well, 61, 127, right? Uh, oh, that's the flight proficiency, 29. You go through all those experiences and I pointed out and I started doing the check boxes because talk talked about putting things in check boxes. Let's see what he's got. Okay, he's got the, the hours on powered airplane or on powered aircraft. Does he have it on airplanes? No, this is what he needs. And then I just went through it like that he was just looking at me like okay he's got that um so it was very it was very quick when it came to that um he also asked cross country definition because some of those things say cross country and i remember uh todd talked about the definition of a cross country and uh, i even asked a question because it was something that i was a little confused about but he asked me what's a cross country and I was like, well, I'm glad I, I saw that on his videos because I went right into the definitions. And he was like, okay, but what's the cross country for a helicopter? I was like, that's a good question. Because the cross country for a helicopter is 25 nautical miles, not 50. So that means he has to, I had to just kind of plug and play things around. And uh, like I said, if it wasn't for seeing those videos in depth and having an instructor like Todd go through it with me, even though we weren't together, I, we went through it on YouTube. I felt like that made a world of a difference because everything else I knew, it was just the CFI aspect stuff. So uh, doing things like that helped me out, watching YouTube watching YouTube videos uh, with the things that I was kind of uh, concerned about, like, you know, the aerodynamics, how to teach aerodynamics or memory aids for special use airspace or memory aids for the cloud clearances for class golf, things like that. I would just YouTube, um, reading the P-Hack, very helpful. You making my lesson plans based off of that. Having study aids. I had bought a paper. I bought a little airplane. Um, explaining gyroscopic precession was something that was tough for me. So I bought a gyro, and I took it to my check ride, and that was the best way I could explain it because he made me do a steep turns maneuver. So I'll talk a little bit about my check ride. So that's kind of how I prepared going in here. Just a lot of writing, watching the videos. YouTubing, doing grounds with my instructor, teaching other students with my instructor supervision. So that was kind of like how I prepared. And uh, going into the check ride, of course, I was nervous. I had uh, the check ride jitters, but I felt prepared. I was like, I've written everything down. I have all the, the study stuff. I know my acronyms. Uh, I made sure for a fact that I knew what was on the PTS, the things that I had to teach, the things that, things that I had to know, I knew that. So logbook endorsements, there, I wasn't going to get stomped on that. I knew everything, scenarios, at least I felt like I did. And I knew runway incursions and everything else, right? I just made sure I knew everything. The day before, he told me I was going to teach steep turns. 
Yom Ha. So I made sure that that lesson plan was spot on. And if there was any questions, and the day before, I also taught it to my instructor. I was like, did I teach it good? Did it make sense? He was like, yes, just maybe don't go too into detail, like, like we talked about. Don't give them too much. They'll ask the question if they need it. So when I got to the check ride, we started at 8 o'clock, and we started with the foys, three hours of the foys. And I got my way around it because I know it pretty well. Um, the acronyms help me, but it, it, it's more than just knowing the acronyms. It's speaking about it. So like helping students learn. How are we going to do that? We do it by X, Y, and Z. Knowing acronyms and uh, like the laws of learning. Okay, readiness. Cool. You know what that is. But what, what, it, what does it entail? What does being ready entail? How do you know someone's ready to learn? So I knew the acronyms, but I also knew to give more and, and speak about it. And he was very satisfied with that. We went through pretty much everything on the FOIs. Um, he liked it. It was three hours, but he was very pleased. And I feel like that first impression goes a long way because he was like, this gentleman is prepared. I like it. So that was three hours. We moved right into runway incursions. And he just told me, how would you teach someone runway incursions? At this point, he let me use my lesson plans, but I didn't really need to refer to them. Like uh, I would do kind of what Todd would do, right? Just kind of look at it and then speak to it. And then I would tell him, this is how I would do it. This is the things that I'm looking for. He asked me an important question that kind of tripped me up. He was like, is an airport diagram required? And I'm sitting here like, I don't know, because I fly to my home airport and I know it pretty well that most times we don't, we don't have. Uh, and so I said, I said, yes, I took a, I took a random, uh, I took a random uh, go at it and it ended up being yes, because he told me go to the, go to the ACS for a private pilot. And under the, under, I think the skills for taxiing, it says that you need to have an airport diagram. So things like that, he kind of got me. He asked me, is the ACS regulatory? And I was like, well, I started thinking and like Todd went over the FARs pretty good in depth that I remember I wrote notes because he said all the stuff on the flight proficiency on the 107 or the 127 comes from the ACS. So I was like, yes, comes from the ACS. And he's like, prove it to me. And I was like, 107, 127. And he was like, impressed. Um, he also asked me something about the sectionals is is there does the sectionals account like if i do a cross country from a section and, and, and you and i use a paper sectional as opposed to four flight is it the same and i said no because four flight accounts for the curvature of the earth and the paper nav log doesn't so what may be 50 might be 49 on four flight and that ended up being the correct answer so little questions like that that you don't expect um, he asked, um, he asked me what the difference between the ACS and the PTS was, um, obviously that being the risk management aspect of it. Um, he was happy with runaway incursions, and then he went into logbook endorsements. He said, I'm a new, I'm a new student, zero experience. What do I need? And I told him everything that he needed. He was pleased. He said, now I'm a student that's a foreign student. What do I need? I told him about the alien program, the TSA, all that. He said, what can you do if you, um, what can you do if while we're waiting? Is there anything can we do, any flying? I said, yes, you can do a discovery flight, but that's about it. So just I, every time he threw something, I showed no, um, no confusion. I didn't show any hesitation. I just answered it very confidently. And he seemed to really like that. And he just kept it moving, right? So we went, we got through the log books and, he said he was very satisfied with that. It was about an hour, maybe, if that. And he said, just teach me, teach, teach me steep turns. He said, make sure just, he's like, he, he made, he over, he, he kind of helped me out. He was like, just remember, no, don't remember what we talked about on the, the overuse of abstractions. And I was like, yes, sir, right on. So I got into the steep turns, um, the steep turn lesson plan. And my lesson plan, I have a lot of stuff in there, but I was like, I'm not going to get too technical. If he has a question, he'll ask. So I just got right into it. You know, what is a steep turn? I just talked about, and I had a, I had a visual aid to, to help me. 
so he can see it. And I use my body as well. So I use myself to teach. And uh, I told him, this is us. When we turn, what happens? I would do those. Uh, I would ask those questions because I'm simulating that we've already, we have some, some knowledge of it. Yeah, we're talking about steep turns. You've at least flown once or twice. So you know what happens when we turn. It was like, oh, yeah, we, we kind of fall. Why? Oh, well, we fall because we lose that vertical component of lift. And then we started talking about things like that. I didn't get too technical. And I kept them moving, told them, okay, we're doing first step. What do we do? Clear the area. Make sure we start. We know we can recover no lower than 1500 AGL. So things like that. And then I just went right into the maneuver. When we turn, we got to pull back. I, I, didn't, I didn't use those terms that would confuse him. Um, and he really liked that. When I finished teaching it, he said, he said, um, yeah, you didn't use any uh, over, you didn't overuse abstraction. You dumbed it down to someone that's new, easily understandable. And throughout the time when I finished, he, I said, do you have any questions? He asked me about P factor, things like that. I answered it and I didn't dig myself into a hole. I just gave him, you know, not kind of like the bare minimum. And if he had questions as we went, He'll ask. If he didn't, we kept it moving. He asked me about turning tendencies. Well, what are some, why does this happen? Acting like a student. And I told him, well, because of torque. Well, what is that? Or P factor, what is that? Gyroscopic precession, all those things. So I kept it real, real simple. He liked it. I also think that being prepared before kind of helped my case because if, if I went in there very hesitant, um, not confident with my answering or my questions before, he would have kind of started digging more. Uh, so I didn't let that happen. I went in there confident. Uh, if I didn't know something, there was a few things that I was like, hmm. And uh, he let me look it up. But other than that, we got into the flight portion. And I was very impressed because it wasn't, it wasn't long. It was maybe, it was just an hour. I was expecting a lot more. I was very nervous about my steep turns because I had to teach it. And for some reason on the right seat, steep turns became um became something hard because uh, just the sight picture was different but um I taught him I went through it again I didn't use over you I didn't overuse those abstractions I didn't overuse technical terms that would confuse a student like oh the yoke or give it some power I said look we're going to put the throttle right here so the rpm they're going to stay right there I was very like it was like talking to a, a seven ten year old right teaching somebody like that and he seemed to like it. We did the steep turns to the left, steep turns to the right. And then he challenged me and closed and pretty much put his notebook all on the six pack. He covered everything. And he was like, well, do it again. And I didn't lose any altitude. I, was, I impressed myself uh, when I did that. And he liked it. And he was like, all right, let's move on. And so we went about doing... Um, stalls he acted like a student he wanted me to see how I would take over the controls because he didn't properly recover he just kept holding back so I had to tell him I you know I, before I even took controls I just kind of gave him a chance hey this is what you're doing push, push the nose forward give it some power car beat flaps he wasn't doing anything then I had to take action and I think that's what he was looking for just to see how I would how I would react I didn't I didn't react nervous and he was like oh well, what, what did I do what did I do I was like, let me get the aircraft under control and then we'll talk. Because I felt like if I would have started talking as I'm doing things, I would have maybe mumbled some things or said some things wrong. I was like, look, let me get the aircraft back to cruise and I'll tell you exactly what you did. Sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So uh, when we got the aircraft back. I was like, okay, this is what you did wrong. Um, this is how you can do it better. Never present an issue without a good, without a problem, without a, never never present a problem without a solution so I told him this is what you did wrong but this is how you can fix it so let's try it again and then he tried it again satisfied and then we continued to do uh, the performance maneuvers emergency descents like a emergency landing we picked a spot um, eight ton pylons perfect it was great conditions light and variable day and then we did our takeoffs and landings power off 180s, uh, everything was perfect. I made sure I, if I didn't, I didn't, I never landed before my point. If anything, I was pretty spot on with the landings. I was more nervous about the flight portion, but I ended up doing well. And I also, I think, I think my ground session gave him a, 
the confidence that I was a good instructor because throughout the, the time he was like he was like I'm very impressed I usually don't say that but you did well you look very prepared he's like you're going to be a great instructor and this was before the flight so I'm like okay I can't get a big head let me just continue to be professional always checking my checklist I think I bugged him with the checklist because I was like after every takeoff and landing he was I was like checklist he was like man you're you you really I'm like yes sir because I don't I don't want to leave any room for subjectiveness. I'm going to do the checklist every single time. So after every takeoff, after every landing, takeoff, after takeoff. So I was just making sure I was briefing everything on the checklist, clearing turns, um, just doing everything by the book. By the time the flight was over, uh, he was very satisfied. He said, uh, like I said, I'm very, I'm very impressed. Congratulations. You did well. And I was I was uh, filled with emotions because I was like, this is probably the most rewarding because I gave it six months of hard studying. Like I said, I, I never filled a, a notebook like from page to page, just filled with notes, information, FOIs, FARs. Um, I just did one notebook of CFI stuff, the TSA stuff. And then I also used the. Uh, the study, there's a study, um, I think ASA comes out with like a certified flight instructor study guide, or oral exam, oral exam guide. I use that as well before I'll go to bed. I'll just read, take that with me, take it to work, and then I'll just read. So take my notebook and that, the FARS, I think knowing the FARS, like you said, it's our job. So I knew all of 61, tabbed everything out. He saw that and I think I think all a mix of all that just kind of went uh, helped my case, but preparation I was over prepared, nervous but over prepared, and I I wouldn't take it any other way because he saw that, and I think that's what helped me. I think regardless of the DPE that I would have had, I think if I would have went in there with that same confidence and preparation, I think it would have went well. So that's kind of that's kind of what I did. That's awesome. Uh, I really appreciate that. That's a very thorough recount of what went on. Um, I, I have a couple of questions for you. Can you tell the audience here, uh, what are some of the things that you would recommend to a new instructor when they're getting acclimated to flying from the right seat? Oof, um, patience, first and foremost. You're not, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get it on one. Uh, I, 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 I compared myself to somebody else and I think that was a, a, a mistake because not everybody learns at the same, in the same tone. It took me 10 hours for somebody else that it took five. So just understanding that it's patient, but understanding that it will come because you know how to fly. You just got to get that muscle memory with the right arm and the left hand with the throttle. So that's all it is, is having yeah. patience um, and then just practicing because practice all the maneuvers and then find that side picture that's different because on the steep turns, I, especially on the steep turns, the side picture is so different that I would I would fix it as a as a private commercial. I would kind of fix it a little bit more on the instruments, but as a CFI applicant at the time, I needed to really look outside. So I found where that dash and the horizon kind of split on the right side, and I kept, I knew where it was. So when I went into the check ride, and he covered all my instruments, I was like I didn't freeze. I knew where to look. So just Having patience and knowing that it won't come on one flight, it could. That's why I'm not that big of a believer of those weekly or those weak courses because are you really proficient from the right side? Maybe, maybe not. It took me six months. And like I said, just practicing something else that, that I think is helpful is flying with other, other pilots, having them go to the left side and you go to the right side and just practice um, practice that for the longest I couldn't get center line I was like am I center line they're like no so center line is literally down your chest if you put if you put the line on your chest or kind of like in between your legs you're centered and it's weird because it looks different but you know your center line yeah um, having that pair I think it's called that parallax uh, the parallax yeah. thing but just just knowing that what looked normal from the left seat isn't like going to be normal on the right seat like yeah. the VSI, um, when you look at the turn coordinator, the inclinometer, it might look like it's just a little bit to the right, but it's centered. So just having somebody, having like a safety pilot or another friend that's a pilot tell you this is what it should look like. This is what center looked like. 
Uh, landing to me was like, whoa, because I would come in and I would flare and my right hand is not used to pulling back on the control stick that I would just flare too quick and then I'll float. And uh, so just having patience and knowing that it will come, it wouldn't, yeah. it, it, for me, it took 10 hours, but it can be less just, just having patience and practice. Everything comes, you know how to fly. You just got to do it from the right head. It's just muscle memory. That's it. Right. Cool beans. Yeah. I, you know, one of the tricks I like to do when I'm, I'm getting that parallax difference uh, from left to right seat is I'll, I'll have my, my, my person's flying right seat. I'll have them take a, a dry erase marker. Like, may, please make sure it's a dry erase marker, by the way. And yeah. uh, we'll line up on the taxiway center line or something. I'll go now from your point of view, just reach up there on the, on the windscreen and just put a dash where the center line is. And then they'll go up there. They'll put a dash on the center line. I go, so do you see that where it is? Yeah. That's the center line. So let's just, whenever you're looking up and you're looking outside, because I want that mark to be right in front of them, I go, that's the center line. And then when we make our first approach into the runway, um, it, it, that, it, the view changes as you're coming further out versus when you get closer. So further out, you're pretty much almost aligned, maybe a little bit right. Did you find yourself a little bit right of center line more than anything Always. else? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that has to do with that, that heavy, that arm is kind of heavy. So you're not used to having it there because it kind of weighs down. You kind of have a tendency to want to, go to the right a little bit but anyway um so you know as you get closer and i just like to say all right do you are you on center line and they're like yeah i'm on center line i'm like no you're not go to the left a little bit keep going keep going stop right there so whatever you're seeing right there that's center line mm -hmm. and i say just right on the first lesson i just go that's you know tell them exactly what it is we do a steep turn i say like, tell me where you think the nose is it goes there i go no it's not it's actually there do this do this other thing so that's a big thing so thank you for for sharing that patience is you never can pay too much for patience in this trade uh patience from a flight instructor and patience with yourself as you're learning uh you, you pay a lot for a patient flight instructor and you pay a lot for your own patience as you get used to yeah. the training um you know, one of the biggest things that I think is an Achilles heel throughout this whole entire training process is knowledge test. Um, what kind of tools did you use to, uh, to prep for yours or did you just study on your own? So for the FIA and the FOIs, because uh, I'm, I'm someone, right, we talked about rote memorization and I find Shepard Air amazing tool. I, I know um, no lies. I used it. But for me, it's like I need to understand why, because if I find a question that I get stumped and I don't know the why, it, I, it, I kind of um, it kind of it kind of helps. So I use I use Shepard Air for both. And then I also use the P-Hack, the flying handbook, the P-Hack. I wish I would have used it more as a private pilot student because it has so much information yeah. that I was like, I would, I would just neglect it. I would just as a private pilot, I would just use YouTube, Sporties, all that stuff. But as a CFI now, I, I see the benefit of the P-Hack and the flying handbook. It has everything. So I use that for the things that were tricky. Um, and then I use Shepard Air and it, it helped me. Um, it, it, Shepard Air just really helps you with the rope memorization, but also the P-Hack and then the, the aviation instructor handbook. Like I said, I read it cover to cover with an instructor. And then I went through it with you on YouTube, cover to cover. Um, and I think all of that helped. And so when I, when I got, when I took my FOI, I got a hundred because doing all that, there was no question that I didn't know. It was just like, uh, I, I've seen the questions on uh, using Shepard Air, but then I also know if I, if I, if I process of elimination, if I see a question that I'm not familiar with, I know how to eliminate and find the right answer because yep. I know what it means. So that for the FIA, I got a 93 and then I just um, looked at my deficiencies and I made sure I knew it because DPs like to use that. And so, yeah, yeah I used a little bit of all the books and then Shepard Air. Good deal. Yeah. Learning with all the senses is most effective, right? So well. watching, reading, and, and, you know, it's very underrated. I think that, that people nowadays, I don't know, just, just in general, just for me, knowing what I know about people, uh, reading is so underrated nowadays, you know, and people are like, oh, I want to read, I want to watch a video, or I want to do this, but there's a lot of great tools out there when, when I'm talking about, when I ask, you know, someone say, like, hey, have you ever read this, or have you ever read that, uh, you know, you talked about the power off 180 a minute ago, and I'm like, well, how do you, what, what is actually in the airplane flying handbook on the power off 180, it's a little paragraph like this, um, and it basically says, everything you need to know about this maneuver is 
in the paragraphs above us in in the power off 90. And so when I start talking about power off 180 and I say, do you know about the power off 90? And they're like, no, I'm like, clearly you haven't read the airplane flying handbook uh, <laughs> because it's only a short paragraph like this about the power of 180. And it has no, it, it doesn't tell you anything at all, period, about how to do the power off 180. Yeah. Anyway, I digress. But there's a lot of cool tools out there nowadays when people go to actually read something. Um, and again, learning with all the senses is most effective. So if you buy one of these uh, dictation devices that you can upload a PDF to, and you can upload a chapter uh, of the, you download the PDF, then you upload it into this device, um, excuse me, into the software that you can get for your computer, or for your phone. And then you, uh, you have the book in front of you. So you're, you're looking at the words, but something's reading it to you. And I use uh, one that's pretty cool. It actually shows me the time it's going to take to read it to me, which is that it, it helps solve for that mental block. Because right. I think you sit down, you're like, Jesus, how long is this going to take me to read this crap? You know, and then, yeah. but if you could look at something and it says it takes 27 minutes to read it on 1.0 speed, and you're like, oh, 1.0, 20. What about 1.5? And you put, put 1.5, it's like 21 minutes. And you're like, I got 21 minutes, yeah. you know, and if not, I'll split it up into two or something like that. So, um, um, the reading of the information, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's a game changer. I, I didn't, I passed through all that stuff when I was doing my CFI, cause it was just so cumbersome and, and trying to work a job and everything. And I, I had so many excuses for not reading. It was only later on in my career where I actually started reading and I'm like, God, I wish I would have read this crap a long time ago. It's awesome stuff. Um, and these are also things that we already know. It's just, it's just reinforcing it. And you just yeah. kind of like, I would drive sometimes. And I would put it on, I would do the same thing you said, like use a dictation. I would just drive to work 20 minutes and I would just, okay, I'm just going over things I already know. And it's just reinforcing it. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool thing. I noticed also that you had your, your far tabbed out. I'm a big uh, uh, tab person myself, the tab yeah. meister, uh, what I like to call myself. But, uh, um, you know, I think another thing too, what you can do is you can actually take that far aim to like an office supply store and you can get them to to separate the far and the aim and bind them separately. And then you have like two separate books. Um, again, that's a mental thing where you don't have some big thick book in front of you and you're like, oh, that's a lot of information in that book. And you can get rid of a lot of the fars that's in there. Like for instance, uh, if you don't want to have part 141 in there, just chunk it. If you don't want to have uh, some of the other parts in there that really doesn't apply to you, like part 135, just chunk it. Uh, you don't really need those things in there. And you can end up having that that far where it's only about that thick and it's much more manageable. And when you tab it out, it's just a small guide and it fits into your bag better. You don't have this big <laughs> chunky book in there. Um, so I like what you did there. And my most favorite thing that you said throughout this whole entire thing is something that is really close to my heart. You said there's no room I'm not leaving any room for subjectivity. And I'm going to tell you, folks, if, if you don't follow what John said about that, uh, you're, you're, you're going to lose out because subjectivity is such a big deal on this check ride uh, because you never can tell what type of one of these wacko examiners that you're going to get and they, you know, how they think about things and the way they think should be done. Uh, they, they're they don't want they don't want to stick to, to, to the question and answer stuff it's either do you know it or do you don't you know the, uh, so subjectivity is a big huge thing in this so, so i'm so glad that you said that unsolicited uh for me or anybody else no room for subjectivity yeah. don't leave any room matter of fact i'm probably i'm gonna steal that from him and write it in my <laughs> new book coming out Go ahead. um so john i thank you so much for sharing your story with us i I know that you're so happy to get this uh, off of your chest. I'm sure it's a huge weight off of your chest. I noticed on your notebook, you have a sticker on there. What was that sticker? Yeah, here it is. <laughs> oh, well, that's wonderful. So, folks, if you want one of those nice, pretty CFI stickers, I'll be happy to send you one. Matter of fact, for the first 10 people that like this video, I'll send you a DM and I'll send you a couple of these free stickers courtesy of CFI Pro Courses. And uh, so that way you can stick on uh, whatever you want to stick it on, your notebook, your car, whatever. Okay, it's all good, right? But uh, I appreciate you joining us tonight on this very special occasion uh, where John is celebrating his uh, indu inductee. He's an inductee to the CFI world, uh, indoctrination into the CFI world. John, congratulations on, again, what a milestone in your life. And, and now you, people pay you to fly.
instead of you paying That's somebody right. to fly, which That's is right. great. <laughs> Folks, thanks for joining us tonight on Top with CFI Pro Courses. I'll see you at the airport. Bye.